Mm. So, Trash Fire. Yeah. Episode two. Two. That's the second one. Yeah. After, I mean, after, after the one. first. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, a little bit of time between the first and second episode. Yeah. Uh, apologies. That's my fault. Uh, my buddy, Mike, he works for Salem uh, Fire. He had a medical emergency, um, was in a coma for two weeks, mm -hmm. and then in the ICU for 24 days, got discharged to uh, inpatient rehab. He crushed that. And now he's back at home and he's going to rehab, uh, uh, you know, physical therapy and all that good. stuff. So, so he's doing better. He's doing great. He's He's got a long road. But, uh, you know, it was crazy to see the brotherhood, oh, whether, it was, whether it was his department, which was amazing. They came and got him. Like, I was, like, taken aback by them or us or, I mean, all of Oregon. There's Washington. There was a department from Florida, Colorado. Like, all these people reaching out to help Mike and his family in this time of need. And I just, the whole time, like, as uh, upset as I was, because Mike's a brother to me, I was just, I was blown away. I was like, I do not feel alone. They, they were donating. They would come by, like, do you guys need meals? It, I don't know. It just, the list goes on. It was it was incredible. But uh, <laughs> we'll try to do these more. Yes. Um, that's, a, that's a good feeling, though, right? Like, yeah. uh, when you get to witness that, and we see that with a pipe band quite a bit. And, yeah. you know, we just went and did Rhett's funeral. And one of the things I think I said to you when I saw that was uh, Salem. The Salem firefighters got it figured out. And, and they yeah. do a very good job at taking care of each other. They're always there. And uh, even from, you know, what we saw with the pipe band um, as a mass band from, um, you know, I think we had five different bands there from yeah. around Oregon showing up for his memorial. It that was, was a cool just picture. super, super touching, you know. And um, so I, I know that was huge for him and then also for Rhett's family. That was a big one, too. Yeah, absolutely. What a great uh, career and profession that we have. What a tight uh, group of people that uh, obviously when things like that happen, come together and support each other. Tight uh, family. It is awesome. Yeah, love it. So, uh, second episode to uh, kind of flash back to the first uh, episode, we had uh, my brother, um, Captain down there, Seth McEwen, and he was talking about some training. We're going to kind of uh, do some similar talking today, but a uh, little crazy story um, kind of leading off that first episode. Uh, we like to kind of tell a little bit of a story, crazy, uh, yeah. you know, happenings. I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, so me and my brother growing up, um, obviously he's a big dude, played for Oregon, right, defensive end, uh, pretty pretty stellar individual and we were both pretty large uh, people but he was a senior in high school um, I came back for uh, Christmas break uh, he's uh, working on a senior paper pretty stressed out he's getting recruited by a bunch of colleges and he happened to be going to uh, on a recruiting trip I think maybe to University of Washington uh, thank goodness he didn't go there uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good uh, but you know uh, kind of stressed out and I'm like hey it's everything's gonna be okay um, just give me your paper I'll proofread it go and have a good time um, you know, just chill, you know, enjoy this time. And, uh, we're sitting at the breakfast table. Um, and he said, uh, don't tell me how to bleep and bleep and feel. And, uh, I was like, bleep. Hmm. Yeah. I bleep myself out. Bleep it. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, huh, that's interesting. Uh, so a fight ensued where I <laughs> hit him so hard right in his forehead. Cause I didn't want to blacken an eye, yeah. you know, before we went on a recruiting trip. Had him pinned down on the ground, and I hit him as hard as I possibly could. And he looked at me, and he said, if that's all you got, you're in trouble. <laughs> that's that's yeah. a lot of man meat yes. right there. So <laughs> I said to myself, I am in trouble. Uh, <laughs> as we fought for a little bit more, I felt a smack <laughs> on the backside of my neck. This is why I call this the fork story. Right. So apparently my fork that I was eating with was on the floor, and he grabbed it, and he <laughs> stabbed me in the back of the neck. And it was lodged in there. Was this in uh, Southern Oregon? This was in Southern Oregon. Yeah. 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 Medford, my, my poor Medford mother, area. Yes. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My poor mother was uh, <laughs> saying she was going to call the cops and she was hitting it with a broom and everything. It was crazy. Nonetheless, I dislodged the fork from my neck. Uh, no neurological damage, obviously. Got the use of all my limbs. Great. Great. Uh, but that is my <laughs> crazy start off story for episode two Trash Fire. Oh, man. Last time me and my brother fought. Great times. How old? I was, let me see, I was, he was a senior in high school, so I was sophomore. Same size. Uh, same, same size. Boy, yeah, actually he was bigger. Gosh. Yeah. Biggest sophomore you've ever, <laughs> ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. Uh, cool. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Uh, before we introduce our guest, uh, we have to say our 
disclaimer. Mm. Um, our opinions, beliefs, comments, thoughts, future thoughts, etc., do not represent that of the Department of Eugene Springfield Fire uh, and or local 851. So if you have a problem with what we say, it's us. It's on us. So come talk to us. Not to John, he's scary. Oh, wow, not a very nice person. No, he's approachable. Fork. Uh, fork. <laughs> Just, <laughs> um, Code name. Code name Fork. <laughs> fork. Uh, okay, now that we have that done, our guest today is, drum roll, please. I don't know. How to Manny, do cue the drum roll, please. Perfect. That's Got it. <laughs> Captain Wayne Morris. Captain. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, please correct me if I am wrong. Um Recent uh, training captain position, father, father of how many? Five. Five. Five grandkids. Brave. Holy moly! Brave. Start early. That's yep. what happens. Yep. Brave man. Yep. Uh, veteran, lead piper, and uh, founder of Fourth Alarm Fools. Uh, we'll get into all that. Um, what am I missing? Am I missing anything? No, I've got a beautiful wife at home. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, that's right. Not a single dad. No. <laughs> <laughs> Five kids. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for coming on the show and uh, continuing this journey that John and I are attempting with the trash fire. No, I love this, dude. This is uh, this is good. This is a good thing. I hope so. Very natural. <laughs> organic. It feels organic. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not as handsome as Seth. Oh, I He's a large, gosh, he was handsome, handsome man. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's yeah. funny. I can't believe he came from Medford. Yeah, nah. that's well, amazing. Yeah, weird things happen. <laughs> so let's start off hot, real hot with the topics. Are you ready for this, John? I am. Don't worry. Totally yeah. Okay. Um, so with the thought of you uh, being uh, recently added in the training, what can we? Uh, for lack of a better term, uh, improve within training and our new recruits. What can we? What are What are your goals there? Because um, you know, I've I've talked with I've talked with friends from other departments, and um, it seems like a constant theme that we have. You know, uh, guys will say, "I'm just not sure these guys are ready to go online." Sure. You know. Yeah. Uh, across the board, different departments, right, yeah. saying yeah. the same thing. And so if you look at it globally, that's one thing I noticed it, when I came into training is, like, you get this w big, broader view of the department, you know, and departments as a whole, and you start learning about uh, the fire service uh, in a little bit broader spectrum, right? And so as a, as a captain at the Quattro Loco, I, I should do a shout-out to the Quattro Loco, oh all the God. boys in there uh, and girls. Uh, the boys and girls at Station 4 um, are so thinking about you, and <laughs> we know that you're doing the job. So much Quattro Loco. There's there. so much. Go get a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> Need a burrito. but, you know, when you're at your station, you have this uh, almost a singular view of, like, type A personalities. You're, you're a crew. Everybody, you know, is able to solve a problem if it's given to them. And so um, that's kind of how we operate, right? Like problem and solve it. Just yeah. do your, yeah. just fix it. Believe you know? that. And so, um, <laughs> so, you know, when I got into training, I saw this much broader view of the department as a whole, as a, of the fire service as a whole. And, um, and so when we look at recruits coming out, not to get too global on you, but if you look at our nation, um, fire departments have these um, kind of wicked problems that they're having to deal with. Um, there's there's a number of them, but the majority being um, uh, resource allocation, right? Staffing, and and the mighty dollar funding. Sure. And so that's really what it comes down to. And so you know, if I looked at my department, I would say, you know. If you have a, a, a staff of so many people, mm -hmm. you're able to um, process so many recruits through. If you increase the number of recruits, that's going to change the ratio of recruit to instructor. Instruction is going to be different, yeah. right? And that all comes down to funding again. And so some of that you have control over. Some of it you don't. And so uh, really, if 
if I had it my way, I would love to see a small recruit class that could, we could really focus on and, um, you know, give them uh, some individualized attention. But that's not reality. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and so you do the best you can with what you got. Departments across the United States are constantly being asked to do more with less. And it's just, I mean, that's something we're running into. And so you do the very best you can, and we're getting to the point where we say, okay, what what are the basic skills that these people need to know before they come on the line to be firefighters? My thought coming into training is, say the first uh, the first shift, right? They graduate, they come on their first shift. What's the worst case scenario? What could happen on that first day? And can <laughs> I give them the skills, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to operate and keep them keep them alive, yeah, you know, be there for their crew, and so you pare down the training that they're going to get, and it's like, okay, do they need to know how to repel off of a building? Well, probably not, you know, because they're not going to do that. No, you know, and so we start weeding out training that they don't need and focusing more on basics, and so, uh, you know, in result, this academy I've really pushed on basics like repetition and we and we talked about change uh, john and i were talking earlier about how do you how do you make change and stuff like that and we'll probably get to that later but um it's repetition you know what i mean and so you've got to get these recruits through they've got to do the same skill over and over um so that it becomes natural and then you start you know adding problems in the way so they have to problem solve a little bit and do the skill and then you add skills together and so my hope is by the time they get get out and they get to the line that they're able to do the basic skills, yeah. you know. And so, you know, if you ask what what can we change, that's a difficult question. Yeah. You know, it's like what can the department change? That's across the United States. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are, are we going to have a, a change in staffing? <coughs> are we going to have a change in funding? You know, are the recruit classes going to get any larger or smaller? If they get any larger, we're going to have to add people. Gosh, right now it seems like they're just getting larger and larger across the board for everybody. It's academies across the state that I know of are just getting huge. Yeah, and, and recruitment is a little bit different across, uh, at least in the state of Oregon. You know, we've had a drop in numbers, and so the applicants that we're having come in sometimes aren't the four-year veterans that we were having come in before. A lot of times they're like, yeah, I was – you know, working in a garage or <laughs> whatever, you know, and, uh, and you know, in larger departments for entry-level position, you see that. That's normal. Yeah. So you go to L.A. County or anywhere else, you're, the firefighters that you're having come in are going to be brand new. Like, mm -hmm. this is a coupling. This is like the Higby cut, and that's, this is how you put it together, you know? Like, yeah. that's where we're at. And so you you have to think a little bit, uh, when you're at your station or if you're a station captain or part of the crew, you got to remember who's coming on the line. A lot of us thought, I've seen quite a bit, that that people reflect back on their academy and they think maybe they were a lot better than they actually were when they came on. It's like, you were green. You yeah. know, we I was green. I was not uh, a great firefighter uh, in year one. I'm you know still I mean? green. Right. I'm still right. feeling green, you know. And humble, right? And so you have to have that humility. And so the the whole concept of that's the best they're going to be is when they're in the academy, that's false, I think. Yeah. Because give me a five-year firefighter that's been on the line and notes the job and tell me that they're not better than a brand-new recruit. Sure. You know, so that's that's my thought on it. What do you think, John? I was just going to talk about, <clears throat> so the training um, instructors that you have now, you've got a training captain, you've got a training engineer, uh, or two, two training captains, training engineer, um, and you've got a couple of firefighters that mostly work in the, the EMS side of things with the paramedic stuff helping um, uh, Ms. Anderson. So the one thing I wanted to ask is if you were to get a younger firefighter, <coughs> um, you know, like year five to you know, year 10 that wants to be in training. Do you think there is value in having someone like that included in, in that uh, training complement? It, it would be huge. It would be a huge addition. Um, we, we see firefighters either that are on light duty, 
uh, you know, in our department, firefighters come on, uh, regardless of rank, come in on light duty, and a lot of times they assist us, especially if we have academy that's going through. Uh, it's an extra set of hands. And if if you have someone that has enough skill set that, that they can assist with being an instructor, uh, that is massive. Um, I can't believe the amount of work that the training staff does, you know, if you uh, – across the board because mm-hmm. it's not just the academies you know you got officer de- officer development you got engineer sure. development you've got all of the ems stuff um it is a massive amount of work a- and that's not counting all the outside stuff that comes in you know training for outside departments that come in to use a burn building um the young women's fire camp comes in that's a a huge amount of work yep. you know um and w- we put a lot into it and so the training staff that we have uh it's like just juggling. It's like spinning plates, you know, yeah. like a lot of them. And so you have to be able to take on a lot of tasks. And so anytime that you're going to introduce uh, one more person, that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. And what, yeah. in your opinion, uh, what is in training uh, for like an, a recruit academy? What is the optimum span of control? would you say you know sometimes what we do is we break so we have an academy right now of um i think we started with 13 Mm -hmm. and so you know um if you can break that in half what we've done is split the class and and send half of them to do fire skills and half of them do ems okay and so if i have five or six um that is super easy to work with Uh you know and you can really give some one-on-one um, training. Okay. And so, you know, any, any time you get over a class of 10, um, it, it starts getting more difficult to ensure that each recruit gets through and gets the exact one-on-one time that they need, mm-hmm. you know? And so, I mean, a lot of that's wishful thinking, thinking, of course, we would love to have a, a, a small academy size so that we could do the work, you know, that that's may or may not be realistic, but, uh, what you can do is adapt the schedule Mm-hmm. Um, so that you have that, you can split it up so that you have the time to work with them, gotcha. you know? So do you think, uh, like a, a one to two ratio or a one to three ratio in a perfect world? You know, if you had a one yeah. instructor for two or right, three, right, right, right. you know, we work in crews of three right. or at least, you know, we've got the, you know, buddy system. So you're always going to want to have two. So in uh, a uh, world, about three, about yeah. three, you know, if we send, um, so we bring crews in to assist with the academy. Uh, I like to have three engines come in if if they're available, and uh, often I'll send them three recruits, and that's enough that they can that crew can work with the recruits one on one, you know, and, sure. and they do end up getting a lot of good instruction Perfect. that way. Yeah. What cool. Do you, what do you? Uh, <coughs> maybe uh, that's better. <laughs> uh, so, something that I've noticed and I'm curious about because you have what you learn in your academy and. Each academy is different in some form or fashion, um, but you have these crews coming in. So you get these three engines coming in, and then they uh, see a recruit tie a halyard off a certain way, and they're like, "What the hell is that?" You know, like what do you do you did you tell your guys and gals like anything, like yeah, like hey, yeah, you're gonna learn sixty different ways to tie off the halyard yeah that's been an issue and so you know our the department i work for our department is um unique in that way because we had two cities come together you know with the merge in addition to that every station has their their captain may have a new hot trick that they know that's a better way of doing something so if we're just talking about tying halyards one of the things i did when i came on was we're going to have a standard i've got to teach only one way of doing it because i cannot teach them you know, like one way and then have someone else and show them another way and just say, okay, well, you guys figure out however you want to do it. You know, that doesn't work. They have to have one way to practice. And so one of the things I did is I came up with these um, standards, you know, and I I would hand it to the crews coming in and say, hey, this is how I want them to throw a ladder. And this is my expectation for the Talyard High. Uh, how you're tight, please. <laughs> <laughs> or, or a Talyard high. Talyard yeah, high. A, a, a tal- Talyard is a city in Colorado. Oh, love it. Gotcha. Or Telluride. Po- population five. <laughs> right. It does not exist. Okay, so uh, 
anyways, uh, so I, you know, I try to make a standard for one way of doing things so that they learn one way. And then I explain to the recruits, listen, you're going to have crews come in that have more experience, uh, that have been shown something different. They may have a hot new way of doing something that's great. Um, but this is what you're going to be tested on. Please inform the crews that you have this way of doing this and you have to do it that way. Now, you get out on probation, you're with your captain, the captain shows you, I want you to tell, uh, I want you to tie this halyard like this. Fine, go for it. And you come back on your final, and that's how your captain wants you to do it, go for it. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, at least for the academy, I, I think it's best just one way. And, and, and it happens all the time, it happens all the time. And they come up to me and they're like, hey, Cap, uh, they told me I had to do it like this, and I was an idiot if I did any other way, so I just did it that way <laughs> mm-hmm. until they laughed. And, I was, you know, that is what it is. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just to add to that, when those crews do that, uh, you know, tying it a different way, it is truly in good intent. Absolutely. I believe wholeheartedly uh, witnessed and, you know, been trained by people here, and I can't say uh, enough about our people want to help Yes. Other people. Yes. So, uh, you know, with that, you know, a little bit of those issues that you have with crews coming in, it is only because they want to help. So, Absolutely. You know, and yeah. make people better. Absolutely. So, yeah. What a, what a great department and we actually, you know, have here and all the uh, personnel truly, truly want to help people, pr- uh, you know, progress in their career and learn and be efficient. So yeah. um, to, to piggyback off of that, too, you know, it, it, you know, in academy, yes, good to be proficient in that one way. But later on it is amazing to have multiple different ways to do it so it, it i i i look at it as a blessing you know with with the two departments combined and having all these different crews and then like john saying like everybody just wants to help uh, i mean it's to me it's it's awesome it's yeah yeah, yeah more and tools yeah tools is exactly it. and and that's what i've told the recruits you know it's like hey take that information it's another tool for your toolbox and you just put that back there and you keep it in there and you don't know when you're going to pull it out and use it, you know. Yeah. So um, it's um, it's helpful across the board. I think I think that's something that, uh, you know, that not just in the fire service, but in any job or in anything, you know, people have different ways of doing it. And I think that it's important to remember to be open to what they have to say, know how you can do it and then but continue to listen to them. You know, you never know when you can you know, apply whatever it is that they're teaching you. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, moving forward, what do you, what do you look for out of a recruit? You know, what in Academy you're, I, you know, you have these benchmarks, you have the midterm, you have their exit out of Academy, but through that, are you looking for any certain traits beyond, you know, being able to throw your SCBA in X amount of time and the hydrant, et cetera? Like, what are you looking for? Attitude. Attitude is huge. You know, the, I mean, you, I can take people through the academy, you know, but if they have a bad attitude, they're not going to make it. Sure. You know, and they have to have, um, they have to show the ability to improve. Yeah. You know, and so if they have a good attitude and they show the ability to improve, they're going to be successful. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, not like they come on on day one in the academy and they know how things work, you know, and if they do come on with the experience, that it's almost harder for them, you know, yeah. because they, they came on. If you, if you think about our brother, Owen, mm-hmm. you know, he came on with all these years of experience and that's super tough. You know, it's like, you have to relearn, but, uh, what worked for, um, Owen was the fact that he had this great attitude, you know, he was like able to adapt and do what he needed to do. And, uh, and that's a huge asset for a, a recruit in the fire Academy. Conversely, if you have somebody that comes on and they're like, well, this is how I did it back wherever. Uh, or if they have any type of an attitude issue, you know, you have to be able to be humble. You know, you have to be yeah. able to take the instruction and just go with it and have a can do attitude and, uh, and put in an all-in effort, you know, to pull from the big four, um, you know, they have to be committed. And yeah. so we put them through a strenuous academy, and it's tough, you know, and um, you're just expected to to take it. And, and so the attitude above everything is going to put them through it. You know, in, in my academy, we had a, 
a, a person that will remain nameless. Uh, they displayed a, a, a wrong attitude <laughs> that, to say uh, PC. Yeah. And uh, how did it work out for them? They are not here. And, you know, um, to be honest, that person was a great person. They would have been a great asset, but they just did not show that attitude. And that's something that I learned early on. Um, my buddy Todd, who works for Salem, he he just always had this amazing attitude. When we were back in fire school, he just, like, you came in every day. You were like, it's like seeing you here. Like, you're like, yes, John's here, for ship. It's going to be a good day. Like, we're going to get stuff done. And th that's just the, the type of guy he was. And, like, you just get energized off of this person's attitude. So I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's an attitude is uh, something that's irreplaceable. And it's completely uh, important. Like, it's important to the crew. It's applicable, right? Yeah. Like, like you have to look at a recruit and how they're going to operate at the station when they get there. That's like really what you're looking at from day one. And you're observing to see how they react to stress. And uh, you're going to apply that stress and you're going to put them in these horrible situations, you know. And uh, they have to be able to adapt and, uh, and just yeah. take it and have a smile on their face and be happy to be there, you know. And it's like, hey, you, you've got three months. We're going to treat you rough, you know, and you're going to have to do things that you don't want to do. And you're going to be uncomfortable and you're going to have to embrace the suck and smile. Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah, and absolutely. so, like, you get out to the station and you have that kind of an attitude. You're going to you're going to succeed and you're going to do great. So, yeah. John, do you do you look for anything uh, being an FTEP and mm -hmm. um, being a leader? within your station do you look for anything when when these guys are coming on out of academy right away um, besides that attitude that we've already identified yeah so yeah the attitude like you said paramount that's uh, it's a game changer one person can change the dynamic of a of a firehouse in either a very positive way or a very negative way so that is obviously paramount so what i do with uh the new uh, probationary people when they come online, uh, FTEP, so field training uh, preceptor, we you know are one on one with uh, our probies, uh, particularly in the paramedic side of it, because that's you know a little bit more cerebral and a lot of moving parts um, compared to the fire side, which is you know uh, just less difficult. So what I like to do with them is I explain the grading system that we um, do our daily observation reports, and so they fully understand you know what what the points mean and all that stuff. But more importantly, what I do, and I started to exercise this a little bit, is I, I during that sit down, I ask, okay, so let's talk about the standard to which you want to be held to. And I give them a zero to 10, right? Zero being uh, sitting here and breathing, you know? <laughs> and 10 being like the <laughs> highest standard possible, right? right? Uh, and I say, just give me a number. What, what standard do you want to be held to? Uh, and in doing that, um, it's a it's a really cool thing because they tell you uh, what standard they want to be held to, and it gives a little bit of insight on, you know, just kind of maybe who they are. And it doesn't really matter if they pick a five versus a ten; it doesn't change my view of them. It just means that you know I maybe just watch them a little bit more closely if they're a five. If they're a ten, um, then I'm still going to watch them closely, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold them. Uh, um, uh, accountable for that standard in which they impose to themselves, right? So That's they're smart. giving they're giving you a permission essentially. If like I ah, le level ten, I want level ten standard, uh, which everyone in, in our you know service usually will say, right? You know, I, I'm a C student. I w would just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, <laughs> Can I just be a five? Yeah, you know, like you test me enough times, yeah. I'm gonna fail. Yeah, uh, I'll be a five. Everyone says ten, right? But it's almost now they give you permission when you say, hey, this is how we can improve here and here here. And if they're like, yeah, well, okay, and it's like, man, that's level 10 standard. And then I also um, ask them, what do they expect out of me? And they usually would say, well, I want you to you know, treat me fairly, and I want you to you know, help me uh, if I need help and um, you know, explain things and you know, go over things, and, and I agree to that. So it's this little agreement. What standard do you want to be held to? What do you expect from me? And then we're going to move forward. And each and every day, I said the most important thing is every day that we're here, we are going to kick ass. And, you know, that means a lot of different things. Badassery. Yeah. Answer the calls. Provide great service to our community. We're going to do that politely. We're going to make them feel good. We're going to take them and, you know, any of our interventions, we're going to do appropriately. And we're going to, you know, make sure that they uh, are transferred off to the hospital. Or if we're putting out fires, we're going to go the extra mile to uh, provide that excellent service. And we're going to do that with a smile on our face. 
you know, sometimes you get worn down sometimes, but when we uh, hit that threshold going into the door, wherever we're going, we're going to give that platinum level service. So that's kind of my Heck expectation. Yeah. I'm all about this now. I, that's what I, that's what I try to do. God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's, let's keep moving. Uh, John, that was awesome. Uh, so this is a little bit department specific, but you know, we have a lot of guys here that, uh, well, hopefully a lot of guys are listening, uh, or guys and gals. How are the recruits doing, our, uh, our recruits? I'm pretty happy with their progress. You know, like any recruit academy you come through, you're going to have um, people that are excelling. You're going to have a couple people in the middle. You're going to have some people that are uh, need some work, you know. And um, as a whole, I'm pretty confident with the, the group of people that we're putting out to the line. Um you know, it's a work in progress. So um, as a whole, they're doing pretty good. I'm proud of them. Uh, they have great attitudes. Um, they are uh, the types of people that I'd like to work with. Um, so we'll see, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm very black and white with the recruits. And it's like it, it, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, I'm going to tell you you're doing great. And uh, I'm going to tell you you're gonna do doing good when you're doing good. And if you're not doing good, I'm going to tell you. You're not doing good, and you need to fix this. And, you know, what we look for is progression and um, improvement. And so, you know, at the point where we don't see the improvement, we don't see the progression, and then we need to start looking at uh, different options. Uh, but for the most part, if you're asking me how the recruits are doing, they're doing just fine. I'm proud of them. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask one quick question. Do it. How do you think you're doing as oh, a training I, captain? That- Good kicking question. ass. That's right. I'm that kicking ass. Good question. Yeah, no, I've really uh, Let's I, take a poll. Yeah. <laughs> I've really enjoyed uh my time. Uh, uh it it has humbled me. Um, you know, I um I had a concept of what I thought a training captain job would be like. Um I did not expect that it is as busy as it, as it really is. Um but I enjoy it. You know, I like training. I always have. Uh, I trained quite a bit with my crews um, before I came to training. And, um, you know, I, I came into the whole job to improve myself. It was a little bit selfish. You know, it's like I had things that I, I needed to work on for me. You know, um, we get on the job. It's kind of a roller coaster. You know, there's there's highs and lows. Right. And so. Um, and you have to change it up a little bit to make that career uh, tenable, yeah. you know. And so uh, I looked at training, and, and I thought that that was a chance for me to look at myself and, and look at the things that I needed to improve. And um, and so I went for it, and um, I, I identified things that I was weak on, and, um, you know, that was the whole reason I got into it. Um, and the other thing is you, you learn more uh, through teaching than anything else, you yeah. know, because you have to be on your game if you're going to b- pass it on to other people. And they'll call you out on it, you yeah. know. They'll call you out on that <laughs> shit if you don't know. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. It's obvious, you know. And so <laughs> you you never want to come into a, uh, a a session of instruction and uh, not not completely be on your game. So Yeah. yeah that's it's that's made me bad. better. It's made me better. <laughs> so you, you said – it helps identify your weaknesses. What what are those weaknesses? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'll, I'll lay it out I right now. It. Yeah, so look, uh, you get in the firehouse, um, and specifically, uh, you know, with where I've been, I've always been at a busy station. I, I've never, like, just glided through. Yeah, I was at the loco. Uh, I was at station one. I was at station 10 in its heyday when it was the busiest uh, station of medic. Hmm. Um And so, you know, that tends to uh, add some complacency, uh, especially when you're running those calls where you're so freaking busy and you're just in survival mode. And you're just, you know, it's like I felt like I could be a better firefighter. And I just looked at myself and I was like, hey, uh, you know, I've got things that I could work on. And so I started looking at outside training, you know, brothers in battle, nozzle forward, uh, going up to the conference in Portland. Um, you know, you want to uh, master your craft, right? And so that's uh, that should be the attitude that you kind of try to promote in the fire service as a whole, constantly learning, right? And so uh, I get into, into training, and it just is a 
it's a good venue for all those things. Yeah. And, um, and it's a good way to focus on on being better at your job. Yeah. Sweet. I, I got to tell you guys right now, I'm having some serious <laughs> trouble <laughs> with my mustache. I'm not used to this. Like, I'm, like, talking, it's in my mouth. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't know. It's that's that's, that's it, going to be a podcast because it is beautiful. I need to know how to talk and to do firefighter things with a mustache because I feel like you do them differently I when you know. have a mustache. I haven't had have a you, mustache. Uh, have you, I don't know if I've seen you. Uh, I can't do it. No? mm What happens? Well, I, I can, but I want to grow it down here, and that's uh, Ken's policy. So uh, I, I can't do, like, a regular Tom Selleck like you're rocking yeah. right now. <laughs> can't do that's it. funny. I had just had this lady in Seven Eleven earlier today. She goes, "You look, look like a young Tom Selleck," and I was like, "That's the best thing I've ever." Yeah, heard. Magnum PI. I it. feel like I'm sitting yeah. Right yeah. next to Magnum Holy PI right smokes. now. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> so often you hear the phrase, and we kind of touched on it earlier. Well, back in my day, it was sure. this. You know, we're, I got to ask. You know, I'm green. I'm new. I've been here, I joke around with my fire crew, uh, you know, I've been here like 42 months, you know, makes it sound longer. Um, <laughs> uh, for those of you who can't do math, that's, well, that's a little, not, that, not that long. It's not that long. Um, were things different back in the day or are people today different? You know, John and I were talking about this leading up to the episode, millennials. Is that a thing? It's not a thing. Good. Hey, listen. <laughs> I, I don't. I I'm don't buy into the whole millennial th- thing. I mean, there are millennials. It's it's a generation, right? But wait, I have a serious question right now. Who who decided? Who, I don't know who, who that is. Who, I don't know who, who's like. All right, well, I'm the decider of right. these people are millennials. Like, right. I want to know who that person is, and I want their address. I like, don't know who. Like, that who is. labels it? Yeah. Like, who's the label? Generation X. Yeah, like, the greatest generation. Like Webster X. Dictionary. Is it them? I don't know where it comes from. It's Trump. <laughs> <laughs> No, hey, <laughs> listen, there's always been the millennial, right? And, and before the millennials, it was a generation X. And in the, in the 60s, it was those damn smelly hippies. You yeah. know, and like going back further, it was those damn little zoot suit kids. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, think about, uh, you know, the George Washington, the first people that stopped wearing white wigs. It's like those people have no work ethic, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I don't buy into that. You, yeah. Anytime you group somebody as a whole, Right, you can't take a, an entire generation and say that they don't know how to work or they're weak or or any of that. I mean, how many millennials are uh, going overseas and risking their life to fight in Afghanistan and Very Iraq? Very true. Right. Very true. And and so if you want to talk about uh, generational things, you got to look at the individual. You know, yeah. and, and I've heard that same thing too. If you if you're talking about the fire service, of course it's different. Yeah, absolutely. It's different. It's different from when I started. You know, I, I came on almost 20 years ago. I started uh, doing firefighting stuff and it was different. Uh, I don't remember any females in the department uh, that I was working at down south. Um, I remember um, like pornographic magazines in every bathroom. Yeah. You know, it's like um, and I also remember going into fires without a, a mask on. And so, yeah, it's changed, and, it, and it's better. You yeah. know, it's like um, I, I love the fact that we have very capable sisters that are out there uh, doing the job. Um, we we need to get to the point where it's the norm, you yeah. know, and and, um, and we take the job seriously, and, and we stop getting hung up on uh, stupid things like uh, sex and race and, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. We are better off now than where we were. Now, there's things from our past that we can learn from, you know, and there's things from our past that we did better than we're doing now. Um, but we just need to find those and, and emphasize them. And, and we need to, um, you know, you can't harken back and be like, oh, things were so much better back when, because that's not necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. I mean, I will say this about the past, and I wasn't there, but uh, riding tailboard, can we bring that back? I heard a story about riding tailboard. I think it came out of Junction City. It might be a story that came from uh, Chief Bishop. I'm, uh, I can't really remember. <laughs> I do remember a story of a firefighter riding tailboard, and they hit a bump, and the firefighter was holding on to the top rail, did a full, <laughs> like, rotation onto the hose bed, you know, and the, and the engine just kept going. So, you, you know, maybe some things are better uh, left. 
mm. in the past. You know, I uh, <laughs> one of the guys when I first started, he was like, "Back in my day, we used to ride tailboard," and he was telling us about how you know you got the hard suction hose riding down the side of the engine. Well, you know, it ends at the tailboard, and he said that he used to mess around with the engineer and just blowing his <laughs> in like the cabin like god damn it turn that siren off <laughs> it was such <laughs> so classic my uh, my uncle was a firefighter um outside of boston and uh, i tell the story because it kind of harkens back to that old school mentality uh and so you know ponds freeze over there all the time and and so ice is really an issue and they have ice rescues and so back in the day uh Someone had gone out on the ice and fallen in, and his engine was the first to arrive with a stady or a or a police officer or something. So they tied a a rope around my uncle in his turnouts. You know, he had three quarter boots on and the whole the whole thing. Yeah. He shimmies out on the ice, grabs the guy. They pull him in. This is dead of winter in his turnouts, right? He gets soaking wet. He breaks through the ice, grabs the guy. They pull him back. The cop, you know, help pull him. They get him back. The chief arrives. They end up making this safe, like they saved this guy's life. My uncle's freezing. He's <laughs> just like shaking, you know, he's soaking wet. His boots are full, the whole thing. And the chief comes up. He's like, hey, let's get you warmed up, buddy. He puts a blanket over the top of him, gives him a flask, good <laughs> Irish whiskey, get yourself warmed up, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That was way back in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what year were you born? I'm an 80s baby. Uh, let okay. the record show. Okay. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, John, you've you've been in the fire service a little while. You know, back back over. Yeah, you know, well, back in Cleveland with yeah. my first career job, and I'm but I'm happy to be here. Are you are you noticing a difference? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, talking about uh, back in the day, I look at that as uh, not necessarily a, a bad thing, but uh, when it comes to tradition. I think that we should continue a lot of the traditional firefighting uh, things that we do. So I think that's a, a huge value to pass on, uh, you know, through generations. Uh, the the tr the truly good traditional things that fire departments have done and will always do. I hope. Uh, but I agree. I think that uh, I don't really care, male, female, doesn't matter. Yeah. Tall, short, um, as long as you can get the job done and be a, a good team member that's all i care about and we need to foster that environment you know through training through you know interacting and accepting people into our you know firehouses as our new people and you know kind of uh making sure that they know that they're welcome um uh, you know with high expectations you know in performance you sure. know especially when they're new but uh, as you progress you know continue to learn and and my my whole thing is continue to give back right so we provide this service to our community which is awesome and that's our primary deal. But we should also reflect that service back in, into our own, right, uh, in training. I think it's a huge – we should equally um, want to serve our own people. And that's why I have to say I, I really appreciate people like yourself going back into training. Thank you. Uh, to try to, uh, you know, continue that excellence uh, and give back to our own people, you know, that same – uh, kind of like that mirror image, right? We do this for our, our community primarily, but uh, folding that back in to our own people, it's uh, it's awesome. And like you said, short-staffed and you're doing a lot, but um, you're, you know, it's an awesome thing. It, it is awesome. If you, you know, if we're talking about a difference in generation and stuff like that, if you look back, um, w when I got this job, I held on to it with two hands. You know, I was like, thank God, that's the best job I've ever had. Well, think back about some of the jobs that you've had in the past. You know, it's like <laughs> cleaning toilets. Yeah, I mean, I I think about John here wearing a, a yeah, yeah oh, dude. <laughs> a hairnet yeah. or or whatever, yeah, yeah. You know, like like frying some uh, potato chip factory. potato chips, right? Or or working in a prison. You were wearing you know? a hairnet. I did. I didn't even have any hair, but they still made me do it. Wow. And I, you know, eye pro, ear pro. Yeah. I, I would yell at the top of my lungs every day because it's. Would, 330 degree cottonseed oil, right? Yes. And you just like these big giant fryers what? that are the size of like, you know, F 350s. Yes. Right? And there's 16 of them and there's no air conditioning and no fans because it's food production, right? And it's on red brick and there's cottonseed oil everywhere and it's 130 degrees. Yeah. And, and I'm a sweater, dude. I immediately just beat up and I just dripping sweat and I uh, would yell. That's weird. <laughs> Get me the F out of here. And bleep. Guess what? Bleep that. Yeah, bleep that. 
I needed to get out. Well, yes. But that's the desire that it takes to want to progress, right? So right. if you don't know what bad is, and that was bad because I was getting paid like nine bucks an hour. Right. And so <laughs> yeah. you totally appreciate it, right? Love you, it. you get here, yeah. you, you, you get your ass kicked on the medic, and you're like, man, it's not so bad. What do I have to do? Sit down. <laughs> yeah. You know, like. Yeah. Here. Take care of this person. That's so all right. Easy. I th- I think back to one of my first jobs. I was uh, a janitor, and nice. It was I can this, totally see that. Yeah, especially with the mustache. Yeah, right now it was this fancy restaurant. Like, yeah, <laughs> Manny's <laughs> laughing. Let the record show. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's this fancy restaurant. Like something like today, I still can't afford to go to. Right. But they let me clean the toilet, so I was thankful. But I remember one day I went in and I cleaned. All the all the stalls, I cleaned everything, and the bathroom still smelled like. Sh- and I'm like, what the frick? Like, where, where is this smell coming from? Well, I found out when I emptied the trash, it was one of those countertops with the hole built in, right. and then it, you know the trash cans underneath. Someone decided to sit on the countertop and poop in that hole. They had to go. <laughs> they had to go. Seat was taken. That's when I knew. Right. I wanted to be a firefighter. Right. <laughs> I was like, there is no future for me. Like, you can't even make this up. Right. How, how does anyone do that? Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. So, you know, we, we all have those points. Um, okay. Let's shift gears a little bit. Last episode, pilot episode, some, yeah. some would say. Pop the clutch. Pop the clutch. We talked with Seth on the first episode, what he was doing differently with his department and training. The million dollar question is that we didn't necessarily address how do we instill that change? You know, there are right and there are wrong ways to do change. You know, you can do it through uh, making it uncomfortable to work or, you know, we'll hopefully talk about the right way to do it. (laughs) It's it's tough. And John and I had a good conversation about this a a little bit early because you were late because you ended up speeding and getting a ticket. Yeah. Uh, We won't bring that up. No, um, I, I got a warning. I'll let the record show. Oh, you did. Warning. Nice. Right. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ford Focus race car. Right. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Oregon State. <laughs> Police. Um, yeah, so affecting change, you know, it's not it's not an easy task in the fire service. And so, you know, what I was telling John is it, repetition, right? And so... Um, you were probably taught to throw your pack a certain way and you throw the pack the same way every day you come into work. Yeah, you know, like a rock it's star. Like you know how to deploy a hose. You've deployed it the same way all the time. Uh, your hose loads are always the same. And so you, you get into a norm, right? And so if you've done this for 15 years and then someone comes in and says, hey, I've got this hot new, hot new way of doing this thing, um, it's going to be difficult. And that's not something that you can do one day of training and uh, affect change. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you have to have repetition and you have to make it the new norm and you have to do it so often that it's um, you're used to doing it. And so th- the idea of uh, creating change in the fire service, that's always been a hot topic um, because there are new ways of doing things. There are new ways of handling hose. Um, but a lot of times... It, it's just um, it's just looking at how we've done it in the past and putting it together in a package and and doing it um, in the same way. You know, and not to be too cryptic about it, but um, if we if we look at um, most recently, I went to the nozzle forward thing, and uh, he he got information that we've been using for years, for decades. You know, yeah. like. It's not new information. It's it's just a new package in, in how you do things. But you cannot take that information, give it to a seasoned firefighter, and be like, hey, we're doing this new hot thing, and not have an answer of why. Yeah, You've got to tell them exactly why. You've got to explain it uh, to the T uh, so that the firefighter understands why we're making the change. And then it can't be like a one-day class or a, or, or a one-day um, training evolution. It's got to be continuous. You know, you've got to continue to train uh, to make that your new norm. Um, otherwise, you you feel like it's awkward. 
Yeah. You know. So in talking about change in our conversation, we were talking about, you know, people, and we have a lot of them that are, you know, highly motivated people. They want to go get new information. They want to go to training classes. And that is great. And that is obviously encouraged by our, our, our department. Um, when people go out and get that information and they come back and they want to share that, um, sometimes uh, it gets, uh, gets squashed a little bit. Right. So, right, right, right. Um, you know. The, the you dude. Know, yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's happened in the past and, you know, you have these really, really um, eager and really energetic people and people that really, really want to do the absolute best for um, not only themselves, but they want to bring it back. And like I said, provide that service back into, uh, you know, their 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 workforce, their their firehouses and their fire department. And uh, sometimes they've kind of reached a little bit of a ceiling. True. Um, so how do we. Uh, encourage that and really foster that type of mentality uh, like we we have now and l and let people go out and bring it back and um, uh, I don't know where you know it, it gets you know kind of squashed but wherever that is um, how do we really encourage that and let people do that and bring stuff back and um, you know not um, have anyone you know uh, for lack of better words just you know get to a certain point and and reach a ceiling and then they get frustrated, right? They get frustrated with trying to go get information and trying to get better and then trying to give that back, you know, to their service. And they start getting frustrated and then it kind of squashes their spirit a little bit about that. Um, and then they um, just become the check norm, out. right? They, they check out, right? So, and so they go, that, that absolutely happens in our department. It's happened a lot with a lot of really great, aggressive uh, firefighters that that have the knowledge, they want to push, they want to make the department better, and they get up to this point and they're told no, and then it's like, hands off, yep. f this place, I'm out, I'm going to do my thing and take care of my people, and that's it, you know. And so that is something that we run into. I I, I think in our department, something that's worked really great is the fact that they created the training operations board. Nice. Um, you know, and so that's a a way that you can bring in information like that and distribute it and and look at SOPs that need to be changed and um, you know, look at making changes within the department. But the biggest thing, uh, if you're the individual that's coming up and and you have something. Whatever it is, you know, if you're looking at the department, and you want to make a change. You you have to be tenacious, and this is, this goes across the board. This is not singular to our department. This is nationwide. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's like um, creating change in the fire service is difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and so, you know, you have to know the right people to talk to. That that's part of it, and that's part of the the good thing about the training operations board is. Uh, people have a place where they can like uh, input information uh, so to speak um, but then you also can't give up once you get that first no you know you just have to you go this route that doesn't work okay regroup i'm going to go this route and then you know there's also the situation of you um timing you know you have to understand the timing and where you're at and what what is going on uh, in the department right now and what the hot topics are and look for that opening when it's time to insert, you know, insert your information and, uh, and try to make that change. And so that, that's one of the things I noticed coming into, uh, training is I came in with all these hot new ideas and, uh, things that I wanted to, wanted to do. You know, one of the things was, uh, drive through training. I wanted to start doing, and I had worked with, uh, your brother Seth on this. Mm hmm uh, and yourself. And, uh, you know, sometimes you just have to hammer down and just do it. You know, you have to be in the right position, but you, you also have to look at, you know, who do I need to help me, uh, make this happen. And, um, and when it comes down to it, sometimes you just have to hammer down and, and make it happen. Nice. You know, so, um, you know, that's my two bits on it. Have you noticed anything, uh, or, or different ways of, uh, coming in and, and making change. I, I know that, um, you, you know, you, John, you are a uh, force to be reckoned with. <laughs> I think it's basically due to your size that you instill fear in people and it makes it easier to pass on information. Did um, you say Jeremy when you said this or John? I couldn't hear you. The right, <laughs> right. Yes, I said Jeremy. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, there's, there's a way you do it. You start out with yourself. 
in your sphere of control, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's so there's so much that you can control. And uh um you know, if you're you're trying to make a positive chain, you gotta start with yourself mm-hmm. and, and be the example and uh and and do the things that you think are important. And uh if you set a good example, uh people are gonna catch on to that. You know, and if, if the, the thing is, people will say, like the battalion chief group, they don't want us to train or, you know, they don't want us to do that's that's false. You know, like your battalion chiefs want you to get out and train the department as a whole. They want you to get out and learn new things and do new things and do mm-hmm. and be great at your job. And so it's just a matter of finding the right route to to bring that information in. And then being consistent and uh, tenacious about getting the information out, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the intent too, right? Right. The intent, uh, you know, for me anyways, is I want to be, you know, good for for myself and my skills and all that stuff. But the intent for me, and people know if you're genuine about your intent, right? If you're about the the men and women, you know, on the department, you know, getting better genuinely, it's easy to you know, move down a certain path. Right. And I think that being genuine and that's leading, you know, and that's showing through example, right? Like actual actions versus a lot of talk. Uh, and that's just how you come into work every day, how you do your job, your interactions with people and, you know, trying to be as good as you can be. And then when it comes time, if you want to be a teacher or trainer or FTEP or whatever you want to do, and you have this, um, you know, opportunity, um, that, is much more easy for people to you know accept and be like oh yeah because i know he's about the right thing he or she is about the right thing right and they've done it and i've seen it and i know it's not you know just a bunch of talk right so i think that you know your reputation just about who you are and uh that you it's all about us it's all about getting better together right so i think you are a great example of that i've always liked working with you and around you as a captain and i've seen what you're doing with the training academy and i can't say uh enough good things about just you as a person right positive hard working and you do that by example and you know you're not just saying it but you're showing it so i think that's part of it as well i appreciate that but you you look at the negative um side of it too you know if you come in and all you have is this place sucks i can't believe this is wrong and, and that's the easy route mm-hmm. right it is so easy it's to contagious. it is so easy to sit at the table and complain about how effed up things are you know it's like of course firefighters complain all the time and if if you come in with that type of attitude uh whether it be if you're going through the local if you're going through the department and your attitude is they are not going to listen to you. Yeah. You know, it's going to go to the wayside because it's it has no validity if you are uh, <laughs> popping tops. Oh, Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, like you. If, if you come in with a negative attitude and all you do is complain about how things are so effed up and there's, no, you know, yeah. and, and you don't come with a, a way to solve it and a good attitude, it's not, you're not going to be successful. Mm-hmm. So. You know, it's funny. It, it, it is just so contagious when you have that negative attitude around the table, like you're saying. But, you know, and, and guys are like, you know, this isn't this isn't my life. You know, there's more to my life. And there should be. You you have balance in life, family, whatever all the other priorities are that I won't get into. But it this should be uh, something that you identify with to a different level than someone who has a run-of-the-mill job like uh, whatever. I'm not going to demean anything here. But you know what I mean? Like the outside training, it should be there. If you can't train for 15 minutes a day, whether it's throwing your pack once, yeah, you did it in academy 100 times and you did it on probation 3,000 times or whatever, but throw it once today, you're going to feel better doing physical activity and you're going to be that much more confident when and if your number's called to go save a brother or sister in that fire. Because I'll tell you what is not cool is not being able to perform when when that is the time to perform. Because I don't want to let either of you down. I don't want to let any of my brothers or sisters down. Like, that's my biggest fear. Sure. And, yeah, it's just. Yeah, one thing that uh, uh, Aaron Fields had said um, from Seattle um <laughs> And it just rang true, you know, the bagpipes, the brass, the uh, the honor guard, all this stuff that I'm really into, you know, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't mean if you can't pull a line off the engine and do your job, 
right? True. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. The brotherhood means nothing, you know, it, unless you're able to do your job. That's what it's about. It's about those basic skills and being good at it. And, and you know, when I was the captain at four, um, you, I, I would try to do something, you know, try to do something every day. And if you go out and train, you know, if you're going to go out and do a drill, I've had crews, uh, you know, you get that salty engineer that uh, wants to hang out and eat Cheetos, you know. It's like that's that's what they want to do on their shift. Damn Cheetos and, are uh, good. And you tell them it's time to go out and drill, and you, you get complaints, you know. And I've had complaints on my way to the drill field, but on the way back, I've always heard, man, it was good to get out and throw a ladder again. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. I've never had a complaint coming back from the drill field. And so, you know, that's the mentality you have to have to have is like just try to do something. Yeah. Um, we're going to we're going to jump into the quick attack round and then we'll close up. But uh, so here's the rules of quick attack. Thank you, Frankie. Frankie suggested we went from lightning round to quick attack being uh, a firefighter yeah. Yeah, phrase quick here. Quick attack. Quick attack. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for quick attack? I have no idea what this okay. is. Okay, you have to answer questions fast because no, I, I mean, Manny wants yeah, this done in like an hour, a, and we have like tw- 10 seconds. Yeah, he's like, hurry it up. <laughs> he's like, we're sick. Have we been talking time. that long? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Holy. Well, so, uh, an example, so an example of quick uh, – like Don't quick, look at the questions. Yeah, don't look at the questions. This is impossible. <laughs> Just listen really okay. quick. This is a quick example. Mayonnaise or milk, Miracle Whip? Dude, mayonnaise. Thank you. Good. See, that would okay. be an example. Miracle whip is weird. Next question. Perfect. This is a this is a, a riddle. Uh, this five letter word becomes shorter when you add two letters to it. What is the word? Uh, I don't have an answer for this. That. Five letter word <laughs> becomes shorter when you add two letters to it. What is the word? Shorter. Shorter. Boom. Yep. Is that a five letter word? Short becomes shorter when you add two letters to it. Okay. I'm such an idiot. So what's your bench? <laughs> my bench. Yeah. How yeah. Much, how much you bench? How much you yeah, bench? Yeah, my body bro? weight. My body weight. Cool. Cool. Real cool. Le- like a two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you they called me the meat in the academy. No. The yeah. meat? The meat. Wow. Yeah. That's a nickname for sure. The meat. Don't know what that means. Has nothing to do with the bench. Talk to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Craziest thing you have ever done. Go. Three. Ooh, I two. can't talk about it. <laughs> I can't talk about it. I've done some crazy things. Uh, uh, yeah. I went skydiving one time. That was okay. crazy. Okay. Cool. Go to song if you were to play one during a fire. If you had time, you know, you're rolling down the road, you can just hit the, the iPod real quick. What is it? What's that song? Uh, Dropkick Murphy's Rose Tattoo. Never nice. heard of her. Next question. What rock group has four men who don't sing? Rock group with four men don't sing. I don't know this. I don't know. I, don't know I've, this. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I've got nothing. Mount Rushmore. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Mount Rushmore. We'll it's count, we'll it's a play that. on words. It's a riddle. We'll count that. A uh, guilty pleasure TV show. Oh man, Desperate Housewives. Naked and Afraid. Oh my gosh, <laughs> sounds good. Cool, yeah. cool. They get sunburned. John. So how about this one? If you could be a superhero, who would you be and why? Mm, Superman. I mean, he's got the laser eyes. He can fly. Extreme strength. Uh, incredibly handsome. He's got that hair thing. Yeah, you know. I like hair. Uh, I the don't tights. have any. Mm. Perfect. Tights. Yeah. Whiskey or Cape. gin. Whiskey. Awesome. Whiskey. Favorite color? Blue. Hmm. If you could have one other superpower, what would it be? Like in- invisibility? Invisibility. Oh, freaking sweet. Of course. <laughs> like the same person. Yes. Wow. This yeah. is really this is real interesting. I think uh, about this stuff all the time. If you won the lottery, like $250 million, what's the first thing you would buy? First thing I'd buy? Yeah. Uh, helicopter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. And then I'd be out. <laughs> Love it. Can you fly a helicopter? No, but I know Sven. Yes. And Sven can fly. Got it. Can he? We got it. Yeah. Wow. Perfect. God, this is Army days. You don't know that about people. You know, it's like he never talks about All these people got these. Yeah. He was Army Aviation. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know that. Yeah. He does have the thousand-yard stare. 
He, yeah, he's a scary man. Yeah, he is. I, very nice guy. Very nice dude. You would never know. Gentleman. But he could probably snap your neck. Axe murder. Gentleman yeah. and a scholar. Yes. <laughs> and an assassin. It Incredibly like. handsome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, before we wrap it up here, uh, let's 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 plug some things here. You started a fool's chapter. Uh, fourth alarm seems to be ringing a bell. Fourth alarm. Fourth alarm fools. Yeah, fourth alarm fools. Uh, you you know, I went up to the firemanship conference in in Portland, and I saw the the massive amount of training that they have up there, and. Um, that was through the first whip fools and uh it just rang true to me you know we attempted to do this years ago we tried to start a fools chapter down here i see it as a good way of bringing outside training in uh, trying to increase that uh old school tradition firehouse tradition you know and um and just kind of build on the uh, fire family that we have with our brothers and sisters um you know there's something to be said we normally like to talk about um, work, you know, and it would be really nice to be able to sit down. I tell you, I learn more at the kitchen table or over a beer, talk to another firefighter about uh, our job and uh, our craft. And so if we have the availability to get like-minded people together uh, to talk about uh, firefighting and training and safety and uh, looking out for each other, and we can do that over a pint, and we can go out and do training and uh, maybe decrease the cost a little bit, uh, that's that's what I'm all about. And so we came up with Fourth Alarm Fools. Uh, we're still a fledgling chapter. Uh, we're just getting started, but uh, I'm I'm already in contact with a number of different outside uh, resources to come in and, and provide training, and um, it's grassroots. It's uh, it's going well so far. Do we do we got anything on the books that we can alert people like myself? Yeah, that, that need just to a, learn. Yeah, just a little a tidbit. I was talking to Aaron Fields. It looks like we're going to have nozzle forward coming to Eugene, yeah. um, nice. hopefully this fall. Uh, it might be pushed back. You know, once the weather gets to the point where it starts freezing, uh, we don't want to be flowing a whole lot of water. So yeah. we might push it back, um, maybe to spring if it happens. Uh, but his his request was to do it in the fall, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, uh, guys, I got I said it in the first episode. I'll say it in the second. Maybe we'll do it every episode. You got to take nozzle forward class. It's I'm not saying that I'm the best uh, hoser there is, but uh, that class was incredible. I was with guys I've never worked with before, and at the end of that second day, we were pulling hose two and a half to the third story, like we've been working together 20, 30 years, and like we were in our heyday. It was it was incredible. And 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 just like you said earlier, it's nothing groundbreaking, but he is uh, bringing alive something that was in the past that somehow got forgotten about. I will tell you something Aaron Fields told us uh, in the last class that I took. One of the places he learned to move hose, Eugene, Oregon. Huh. Think Stick that in your pipe and smoke Hump, it. bump, and bow. Hump, bump, and bow. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, lead Piper, Lane Fire Brigade, Pipes and Drums. Let me ask you a question. You have ev- Do you have events coming up? And are you going to play at graduation? I have to know. Okay, I'm not playing for the graduation. Come on! Yeah. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I can have other people come on and do that for me. And yeah. I, I believe I need to be there in uniform for uh, my recruits. Well, will will the band be there? Uh, there will be a Piper there. Yes. Uh, can I just know him? Uh, you can like hum in the background. Yeah, hum. Um, That's a no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nobody lets me on the team. <laughs> you know, you may not know the the band is super busy. We end up with an average of about uh, two requests every month, and so you know, uh, for the size of band we are, that's pretty um, pretty big. The, the last um, performance we had was for Rhett's funeral in sure. Bend uh, for our brother Rhett. Um, just. That was a great experience as a whole and a, and a good show of uh, the fire family and, and what it's all about. Uh, in the future, um, you know, we'll have the graduation. We are going to be busy throughout, but look for us on September 11th for sure. We're going to be doing the stair climb and the firefighter ale night, which we've done every year for the past few years. Um, I would like everybody to show up and just uh, be there. Normally we do that at Ninkasi. Nice. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ninkasi, if any businesses are listening, we would love to host Trash Fire at your establishment. And if you have refreshments, we would love to consume those 
and uh, help promote the business. Um, yeah, uh, Captain Wayne, thank you. Thank you so much for it's being here. It's my on. pleasure. You yeah. guys are uh, awesome. I love what you're doing here. Keep up the good work and uh, invite me back. Yeah, no. G- we give me a little bit of time and then invite me back. I'll tell you what's new. We have a lot more to tackle uh, next time you're on. Um, we just touched the precipice, if you will, of, of what we can do here. So uh, thank you again. Uh, best of luck with the rest of the Academy thank and you. the next one that is quickly approaching. I'm October. Coming in hot. Yeah. October. Coming in real hot. Rock stars. Uh, anything you want to add before we sign off here and, and, and bid goodbye? No, let's wrap this shit up. Yeah, okay. Uh, trash Fire folks, we're coming in hot real soon with another episode. We don't know when it is, but John and I are going to plan right after this. So uh, sit on the edge of your seats because it's, it's coming in hot like John. Uh, what? I don't know. You ready? No, I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Thanks again, guys. See you next episode. All right.